All right. Happy Valentine's Day, everyone, and welcome to February the 14th. And we won't have a Valentine's Day theme today, but we are going to have a special lesson because, as you may know, NASA is going to be attempting next week to land the, the four, uh, fifth rover on the planet Mars on February 18th. And I, <laughs> I love talking about this kind of stuff. Um, I literally <laughs> have to have my kids help time me so that I don't talk too long. We have a, a time at the start of some of our classes at school that I call curiosity links or wonder links, I guess. We used to call them curiosity links. Anyway, it's just cool stuff that really gets your mind thinking. And so I, uh, I told Shelly that I hadn't I hadn't read the chapter yet, the next chapter, but I really thought the space stuff was so cool. And so we're going to read Psalm 8 from the NIV and the message, and we're going to uh, talk a little bit about Mars rovers, and we're going to play a game. So, and if you don't want to play the game, that's okay, but it's a fun online game called Kahoot. That's a quiz game. And so we're going to give that a try. So here's our plan. Uh, where I'm going to pray to open us up, and we have some announcements. <clears throat> our big question today is actually going to be about when you've been awed by the universe or by stars or something like that. Um, that's going to be our check-in question. Uh, I guess our big question, no, so that's our check-in question. Our big question is going to be, um, what do you know now or what are your perceptions now about the universe? How are they different than when you were a child, like as an adult, sort of what what different perspective or new perspectives do you have on, on the universe and God's creation? So we're going to read Psalm 8, um, and then we're going to play, we're going to have a check-in, we're going to do the little Kahoot game, and then, you know, I could probably talk for three hours about Mars missions and exciting things that are going on, but I'm not. I'll probably just talk for about 15 minutes, uh, and then we'll have some table talk to talk about that big question. So that's the plan. So this was the view outside our front uh, on our from our front porch this morning at five degrees, and it is definitely a historic weekend with the weather. Uh, Carol was talking about remembering in the 80s down in the valley of Texas when they had a big freeze. Um, it is not common for us. I, I have a friend in Missoula, Montana, who just laughs, you know, when I tell him about our temperatures and our weather. Um, but yeah, uh, it is a, it's, it's a weekend to, to stay home and to be safe, but also uh, to keep in prayer those that are um, in harm's way, uh, the, the uh, first responders and police, and then all those who are serving uh, the homeless and others um, this weekend. So um, in terms of, well, I guess that, that was our opening prayer. So let me, let me, let me say an opening prayer because that's what that slide is for. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for this day that you have made. Um, I thank you for the, the wonder and beauty of your creation, Lord. We have more insight today because of our technologies into the ways that air masses move and fronts come in and moisture can be ready to fall from the atmosphere. But Lord, we know that you are the one who is in control. You are the creator of this amazing planet. And God, you have given us as your people special roles and special tasks and, and special missions that we are to do. And so God, I just pray that this day as we're gathered again in our houses because of the pandemic, but also because of this weather, God, I pray as we open your word, you would speak to us, that you would open our eyes to hear the message that you have prepared in advance for us. Um, that, that we would be open to your Holy Spirit, and we invite your Holy Spirit with us this day. And Lord, we lift up all those who have to work out in this cold, and um, we pray for protection for them. God, we pray for protection uh, during this continuing pandemic. We pray for our leaders, and we pray for um, the world, God. We pray for this earth, that your son Jesus would be known, and Lord, that we would put our faith in him, and that we would be bold to share him and to show his love to everyone we can. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Okay, so announcements today. Uh, everybody's online, uh, except for the, the select few that are in the uh, in the sanctuary, but there is no 
you know, come to church to worship uh, in person today. It is all online and just, wow, what a, what, look where we've come uh, in terms of our capabilities. I think it is, we've said it before, such a fantastic thing that our church made some investments in some digital technologies and cameras, even before the pandemic, um, knowing that, you know, not knowing that that was going to happen, uh, but God did. And that was one way that he certainly uh, prepared for this time. Um, I want to let you know that the February First Look magazine is available in our app if you have not checked it out. And kudos to Carol, who continues to do great work and, and to um, uh, all of our, our um, media and ministry team, uh, Blair Merkel and, and Tyler and others. So it really is great. This, this is one of the best ways to just kind of get a deep dive into some of the activities of, of our church. And I know that it is... It is easy to feel disconnected. You know, we haven't been to a face-to-face -face church service since March of last year. So that we're going to be coming up on, on a year here pretty soon. Um, and so anyway, thanks to all of those who are continuing to uh, make connections and continue to serve. And just want to uh, encourage everybody to check that out. Um, same announcements as last week that uh, Friday Morning Men's Group is continuing to meet via Zoom uh, likely that there'll be a face-to-face -face option coming, but we don't know when that is. I will say that Bob Lonhart had a great uh, celebration and joy this week in being offered a position with a company that he is really excited that um, is led by men who, who follow Jesus and uh, share their faith. And he has been in, in limbo uh, for, for a number of, of months. And uh, we'll continue to lift up Carol as she continues to search for her teaching role and her place. Um, but Bob just shared that uh, this this Friday in terms of God's faithfulness and you know his, the difficulty he had in waiting, but his thankfulness in the right position coming. Uh, so anyway, I saw his name and thought of that. Um, this Wednesday on February 17th, we'll have an Ash Wednesday service in the sanctuary, and I'm sure there will be an online option for that as well. And it is hard to believe, but that means we are going to be starting Lent, and that means Easter will be here before too long. Um, so I really do encourage everybody to attend that if you can. I just, I don't know that I did that growing up as much that our church made a, a deal out of Ash Wednesday. And I really like how we do that to signify the beginning of Lent and, and have this opportunity to really think about uh, the preparation for the coming of Jesus and what the Lenten season can mean. Max, so, can, I inter can I interject real quick on that? Yes, uh, in, the mail, in the mail, you'll receive a devotional um, that was mailed out uh, for Ash Wednesday, and it's all on prayer, and every day there's a prayer service, but um, yeah, that's pretty cool um, that that's coming as well, so please look into that when you get it in the mail. Awesome, awesome, thank you. Um, today's big question is going to be, this is what we'll do some table talk at the end for, and I'll make sure I save time for this. Um, what new insights do you have about our universe today as an adult? And I don't even think that question makes sense. Um, as an adult, you did not have as a child. So let's say that you did not have as a child. Um, yes, so <clears throat> we've all probably had some kind of experiences like that. And that's what we're going to talk about sharing as far as like some, some moments, whether it was in our backyard or on a camping trip or maybe in a planetarium or I don't know, um, some real, you know, awe realization of, of, of the, of the scope and size of the universe and the amazing complexity of it. Um, but I want you to think a little bit about how you've grown as an adult in terms of those kinds of perspectives. Um, so we're going to read Psalm 8, and I want to encourage you to open up your Bible. I'm going to read from the NIV, and then I'll also read from the message. This is, relatively speaking, for the verses that we've sometimes done, a short verse. This is a Psalm of David, and it has nine verses. And so um, let's hear the word of God as it comes to us from the psalmist. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens through the praise of children and infants. You have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. 
When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And of course, I kind of want to start singing because there's a great song that's set to Psalm 8. I will not do that. We have some folks who could sing even better than I, I know, in our group. But um, here is the message interpretation and a little bit different, a little more contemporary language from Eugene Peterson, but still the same verses. And the message subtitles chapter 8 or, or yeah, chapter 8 of Psalms, a David Psalm. God, brilliant God, yours is a household name. Nursing infants gurgle choruses about you. Toddlers shout the songs that drown out enemy talk and silence atheist babble. I look up at your macro skies, dark and enormous, your handmade sky jewelry, moon and stars mounted in their settings. Then I look at my micro self and wonder, why do you bother with us? Why take a second look our way? Yet we've so narrowly missed being gods, bright with Eden's dawn light. You put us in charge of your handcrafted world, repeated to us your Genesis charge, made us lords of sheep and cattle, even animals out in the wild, birds flying and fish swimming, whales singing in the ocean deeps. God, brilliant Lord, your name echoes around the world. Thanks be to God for this reading of his word. A couple things I think of, especially hearing the message version. Um, one of the videos, which I may play a part of, I, I, I think I put like four videos into the slideshow today. We will not have time to see them all, but one of them, uh, our son Alexander actually found or was recommended to him on YouTube, and it was published in January by NASA, and it's a group of astronauts reflecting upon the impact that seeing the, the Earth from low Earth orbit and then seeing the stars from orbit on the International Space Station had on their lives. The number of stars that you can see when you are outside the atmosphere just totally blows your mind. One of the astronauts said it's actually hard to pick out constellations because, you know, we have constellations that have these you know, large stars or the, or the ones that are, you know, more are brighter to us. But when you're outside the atmosphere and you're just staring into the inky blackness of space, it is absolutely mind blowing how many that you see. The other thing that I think of, and this is why it's interesting, this is a, a contemporary translation is there in verses, well, what Peterson labels verses five through eight. He says, whales singing in the ocean deeps. I watched some kind of a, of a documentary in the last few months that talked about how we've discovered that whales sang and that they talked. And that was really a pretty big deal. It, it became a, a big thing for the environmentalist movement, the whole thing of you know, save the whales uh, resulted from this discovery that whales were able, are able to, um, to uh, vocalize and sing and communicate. And we're able to, you know, put these sensors in, in the ocean and be able to hear them. That wouldn't be a, a, a linguistic articulation of these verses that would have been like, you know, pre 20th century, because that's when we, we actually found out the whale sing. But I, I think actually, that's a great example of where the more we discover and the more that we see of God's creation, the more in awe we can be of the world that God has created, and perhaps the more aware of, of our place in, in the world. Anybody have any thoughts about those verses you want to share or anything that particularly struck you?
or does anybody want to break into song today? Would probably best if we don't try to do, you know, singing together because over Zoom it's delayed. But well, I'd like to share uh, a thought that uh, I really like the message uh, in most areas of the Bible. Uh, however, I think this particular psalm is one that I uh, uh, prefer the traditional <laughs> much more, especially verse nine. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think it's necessary that, well, I'm not here to pass judgment on Peterson, but I, I'm, and I don't know what goes through his mind when he's looking at verses, but uh, I don't think you could have been proved on verse nine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Your name echoes around the world. I, I don't know. It also, I'm shaped certainly by music and thinking about that, you know, s singing that as, as, as a hymn. Um, Majestic is your name in all the world has a much more regal and worshipful sound to it and meaning to it than, than the echoes. Anything else? Okay, so um, I'm going to pause our recording and I think we'll just stay together today rather, rather than... Um, well, no, we'll break up. It's there's. I think it's easier for more people to share when we break up. So I'm, I'll break us into two groups. Um, and the question is going to be, share about a time you were awed by the stars or just thinking about, you know, e either being outside the, the, the size of the universe, um, you know, any, any kind of experience like that that you've had. So let me pause. Okay, now I'm not muted. Um, that, that throws me when we return back muted. Um, so thanks everyone for, for sharing and talking about that a little bit. Um, this is a little bit different as far as being awed by the stars, but we, there were several scouting stories that, that got shared in our group. <clears throat> and um, this cold weather has caused on Facebook some guys that I haven't had connection with for goodness gracious, when, when is 1981? Like, you know, 40 years or something. Uh, and they were remembering about cold winter campouts that we went on. And uh, anyway, just uh, just a lot of stories. Um, so it, this is probably, yeah, probably a good reminder that, you know, not today, not tonight, it's going to be a little cold, but when it's a little warmer, you know, finding those times to go out and to Look at the stars and to see what's going on and especially if you can have a chance to get out of the city um, i know one place we've never been but we've talked about is um, in west texas like in the big bend area that's supposed to be one of the darkest areas of the united states as far as light pollution and there's an observatory that's there for us going to colorado um, there's a pass called cottonwood pass it's above buena vista and we've been able to go there and and so I think I've, sure, I've terrified my wife driving up there at night uh, to get to the pass. But when you get up there, you know, it, it is pretty spectacular as far as the view and, and what you can see. So let's completely ch change gears. Um, we're going to play a game. Uh, and I'm going to invite you to do this on your computer if you can. Um, the way this works is that you will need to go to a, a web link and it's called Go Kahoot. And I'm gonna go ahead and click on this as I kind of talk through this because I'm gonna start this game and I don't know that it's gonna have hopefully the music. Let's see if this is gonna let me, yes. Um, so there's 10 questions. Uh, continue as guest. I don't want lobby music. Let's see. We'll randomize the order of questions and answers. And leave, does it have a game pen? Yeah, it's going to have a game pen. Yeah, oh, leave yeah. it on. Leave it on. Make sure it's showing the whole time. Okay. Show minimized intro instructions. Yeah. Okay. Is that it? Okay. All right. Shelly is an experienced. But not leader. online. I've, I've never done it online with the kids live. Okay. So if you, on your phone or your computer, um, want to do this, and it'll be fun, even if we just have a, a couple people in here, uh, the website to go to is kahoot.it. It's not .com. So it's K-A-H-O-O-T dot I-T. And then it's going to ask you to put in a game pin, which is that 528-9003.
So we will wait just a few, well, I say minutes, a little bit. Um, and as we wait for you to join, this is the NASA JPL simulation of the Perseverance spacecraft, which is going to bring the rover. I think maybe the spacecraft has a different name. Uh, and this is what will be happening on February 18th as it enters the Martian atmosphere and slows down from a speed I should have actually written down so I could remember it. It's super, super high rate of speed. And it is going to um, slow down in the atmosphere. It's going to deploy parachutes. And then it's going to actually have rocket boost uh, rockets that are going to fire. And the last, um, <laughs> Ivan has joined. Um, the last rover that we successfully sent to Mars used this same technique. We have, we've sent multiple rovers, which will be one of the questions in our little quiz here. And uh, a couple times ago, it was the, it, it had these big um, sort of like airbags that deployed and the whole thing bounced and then the airbags deflated and it, and it rolled out and righted itself. This process that it's about to do, or the, the visualization is showing, we have done this successfully before, uh, which is pretty dramatic. So it will basically get really close to the surface and then it releases a cable. And so the, the rover itself, which is called Perseverance, is going to be lowered to the ground. And then after it's safely on the ground, the cable is cut and the landing craft moves off a safe distance and, and it lands. One of the things that I learned watching some videos this week is that we have now uh, some GPS technology that, is, that it will let Perseverance actually land inside this crater and we're, it's right beside a, a, what we believe is a river delta. So the entire area that it will land in we believe was a, a lake in the history of Mars. And we know from excavations and archaeology that when you go to a river delta, which is where the, the water fans out and you know gets shallower, I think Nile River Delta, those areas can be really good for actually finding fossils. And so that's what they're hoping we'll do. All right, so here we go. Here is our rover uh, question. Um, Number one, and it is going to give you, you uh, 20 seconds to answer. You're going to choose the color. So is this true or false? Did the 2008 NASA Phoenix Mars lander have a mini DVD message to future Martian explorers? Do you think that is true or false? And if everybody answers, it will go ahead, I think, and advance us on. Otherwise, it will... So you're, if you think that's true, you're going to press the green or the square. And if you think it's false, you're going to press the blue or the diamond looking. OK, so we had 50%. Get it correct? That is true. Uh, the Planetary Society is an organization that sponsors talks and tries to promote exploration. And um, the thing I ever thought about that is, Who's going to have a mini DV pl DVD player? Like, we don't even have those now. So, you know, I don't know. I, I guess they were thinking about maybe future humans. But, you know, when we sent the Voyager probes and things like that, that was something Carl Sagan helped design was like, how do you craft a message that could be interpreted by, you know, intelligent beings? Um, you know, that somebody had the about fax it. machine. <laughs> yeah, maybe they did. Maybe, maybe there's, maybe there's a player in there. All right. So Shelly happened to answer fastest. And so she has the most points. Everyone's a winner today. So if you're not on the leaderboard, don't worry. Um, here's question two. What are the names of the four U.S. rovers that have been on Mars prior to today? If you think it's crawler, rugged, blur, and shadow, you're going to answer red. Pathfinder, Curiosity, Ghost, and Opportunity will be yellow. Pathfinder, Curiosity, Phantom, and Starlight is blue. Sojourner, Curiosity, Spirit, and Opportunity is green. And that, if you're wondering, happens to be a picture of the Sojourner. And yes, green is the right answer. Uh, Sojourner was the first one that we had. Um, and then uh, I think that I think those are those are in, in order when we've had them. So 
And Denise takes the lead from Shelly. Here comes question number two. When is, and I think I already said this, when is the Perseverance rover scheduled to land on Mars? It has not already landed. So I will increase your chances of, uh, of a correct answer. And it is next week. And that is an artist's rendition of the rover on Mars with a special additional thing it's going to have. Yes, it is going to be on February the 18th. And Shelly is on fire moving up. All right. So the Spirit rover um, operated until 2010. How far did it actually travel? This was a lot farther than it was estimated to travel. And it's interesting, NASA's estimates are always really low. Wow, look how far it succeeded. Like I think it was projected to, or designed to operate for at least 90 days. And yes, almost five miles was the distance that the Spirit rover traveled. All right, question five, we have 10 questions. This is a question about the first rover that was ever sent. When was the first one sent to Mars from Earth? And, and that is the picture of it. Um, there were actually two sent simultaneously by the same country, Mars 2 and Mars 3. Mars 2 burned up in orbit. And yes, it was 1971 by the Soviet Union. And as I was reading, of course, you have to be careful with Wikipedia. Generally, it's a good launch pad for, you know, getting information. Um, it, it was saying today that it only... Um, function. The, the, the Mars 2 burned up trying to re-enter. Mars 3 was the first soft landing we ever had, but it operated 110 seconds before it died. And it sent back like this fuzzy black and white image that really wasn't, you know, that significant. So a little bit underwhelming. All right, Dwight is moving up. Ivan is on the board as well. I was thinking Ivan was Dwight, but maybe that's Greg. Or maybe it's Ken. All right. How many landers have been sent to Mars from Earth? Rovers are different than landers. Landers are just spacecraft that have to land on the, on the surface. They don't really go anywhere after they land. Not including rovers, how many landers? The correct answer is 16. And those are the attempted landings that we've had. And when you look at the, the number of missions, there's a lot more missions that have been put into orbit. Um, a lot of them have failed. So this is space, space travel, rocket science. It's hard. Look at that. And Dwight takes the lead, although Shelly is still on fire. And I don't know exactly what defining you're on fire means for Kahoot. All right, question seven. How many rovers have humans from Earth sent to Mars prior to next week rovers that we've sent and hint the the united states is not the only country well because we just talked about one um how many have have been been sent overall the correct answer is six two were sent by the soviet union in 1971 like i said the first one burned up and the second one landed and operated for all of you know two minutes and then we have successfully nasa jpl sent four. We are four for four. And we're hoping we're going to be five for five next week. Ooh, and Carol Hartsog is on the board moving up. All right, question eight. On February 10th, 2021, that's this last week, China became the blank nation, which nation, to put a spacecraft in Martian orbit? Were they the sixth, the fifth, the fourth, or the third? to put a spacecraft into orbit. This was a, kind of a surprising one for me. And they were narrowly beaten out like days before. So they're the sixth nation to put a, a spacecraft in orbit in addition to the Soviet Union, which we're considering in this question, I guess, Russia, like it, the same country, United States, Russia, India, um, China, the United, uh, well, China was the sixth one, the United Arab Emirates in Japan. Japan is the other one. But the United Arab Emirates actually, and this was amazing, watching their mission control, everyone, you know, had on full turbans and it was, you know, the, the hashtag on Twitter was Arabs in space. Uh, and I actually watched this live um, in, the, in, uh, in Dubai, 
which is where they have this huge, I think it's the tallest um, skyscraper in the entire world. They were projecting all this stuff. And so like literally last week, we, we, before last week we had four. Now we have six countries because the United Arab Emirates and China both got on this list last week. All right, Dwight maintains his lead. Two more questions, question nine. Name the first aircraft, the name of this aircraft that will attempt controlled flight on another planet in spring of 2021. Okay, it's not Perseverance, it's being taken by Perseverance. What is that aircraft that is pictured here? What has it been named by NASA? All of these names, by the way, were submitted by kids and these were some of the top 10 names, and that is, it is, whoa, nobody got it. It is called Ingenuity. Tenacity, Promise, and Fortitude were all in the top 10 of, of names submitted by, I guess, not just kids, but people from all over uh, the world. And Ingenuity is the name of this drone, this UAV, this unmanned aerial vehicle. And this is a test flight. They're hoping to you know, get this to, to work for the first time. And then successive missions may include additional um, UAVs as well. All right, Dwight is on top. Going into the final question, question 10. How many months does Elon Musk and SpaceX project that Starship will take to reach Mars? And a little science knowledge here, depending upon when you launch, Mars is farther or closer away from the Earth. So this will be at an optimal launch window when Mars is going to be closest to Earth in terms of the trajectory. And it is six months. So a six month mission, uh, again, if it's at the optimal, optimal time. And if you have not like checked out the SpaceX Starship webpage, and it is very inspirational, I think, in terms of what we're talking about attempting to do, that Starship has actually had two quote unquote successful, but crashes in the last month um, where they were trying, you know, taking it up to an altitude and then trying to bring it back down to land. And, and it's blown up uh, and not successfully landed, but they've said that they've still learned a lot and it's been successful. Um, it is not as big as the Saturn V rocket was that took our Apollo astronauts to the moon, um, but it is a pretty huge monster. And it's launching from Texas instead of launching from the Cape in Florida. All right, here is our podium of winners. So coming in third place, the Dahlbergs, congratulations. Second place, Shelly, and coming up on top, it is Dwight. Congratulations, Dwight. We are sending you a special prize of praise. Um, and what was that, Denise and was Carol the, the next one? All right, so there you go. That is our Kahoot, yay, it worked. So that is kind of fun. Um, Kahoot is a website that we've used. I used it a lot when I was teaching Spanish uh, with vocabulary. Um, there's a number of other websites that are kind of like it. Do I get a prize for coming in last? You know, you do. I'm sending you a special holiday, a, a um, Valentine's Day, you know, heartfelt wish right now. Okay. <laughs> um, so anyway, that's uh, that's fun. And if if you're interested on the slideshow, I put a link down here. I made a little shortened link, um, but I, I linked to the different websites that I looked at. Um, some of these, a lot of these were Wikipedia, um, space.com also. This is the one for TON1, and this is the mission that China just on February 10th got into orbit. This is the first time they have put into orbit, but they're not only sending the mission into orbit, but they're also uh, trying to land a rotor, a rotor, a rover. Um, and so as it says here with this feat, China became the sixth country to orbit Mars. And they are much more secretive about their space program. You know, it's significant. China is not a partner in the international space station. They, they don't send astronauts. We don't cooperate with them. In fact, there's uh, laws on the books that really limit the amount of, of data sharing that we can do with China. Um, and their, their space program is, is really advancing. Um, they successfully have sent um, ro robotic um, spacecraft to the moon and to the far, the far side of the moon. 
Remember, we can't say the dark side of the moon because it's really not dark all the time. It's on the other side of the moon. It's dark sometimes. Pink Floyd was like wrong. It was not the dark side. Um, but anyway, they uh, are continuing to do, do a lot. And this is really significant. We, did, we didn't know exactly when it was going to be entering orbit. And even that is a feat. Um, there have been or orbiters that have been sent that have, have bounced off the atmosphere. In 1999, the United States uh, sent a mission that burned up also when it was going in. Um, this is pretty amazing. This is the list of landers. And so this shows you all the countries. So here's the you know, the Soviet Union in 71 and 73 with, with, well, I guess 62 was the first one. Failed, failed, partial success, failed. Um, and then the USA, you don't see any other countries until 2003, the United Kingdom sends the Beagle 2 on Christmas and it fails. Um, and then there's, there are proposed missions as well. So the, this is a list of all of the landers. Um, there's also successful orbiters. And so the 49 different spacecraft missions that successful, including unsuccessful, have been sent to Mars so far. And look at that, in the 1960s and 70s, we sent 12 and then 11. Uh, we've sent three already in the 2020s and we're in 2021, barely. Um, and so this is cool because this is color coded to show you whether it was a failure or a success. Uh, Mariner 4 was our first success in 1964. It was just a flyby. Um, and just, I mean, look at all these failures. We, we get, you know, we hype obviously the success, but failure, failure, failure. Um, if you've ever seen the movie, The Right Stuff, I think there's a redone version that somebody has done. I love that movie. It's the story of the, of the Mercury astronauts. And well, it starts with Chuck Yeager breaking the sound barrier and then the Mercury astronauts. I mean, Werner von Braun and the, the uh, former Nazi scientists that led our space program and the development of the rockets. I mean, there were so many that blew up. You know, the first time Alan Shepard got on that Mercury Redstone rocket and blasted off, lots of people were, were literally holding their breath because there just been so many different, different um, explosions and failures. And so we did have some failures in, the, in our space program. We lost our, our Apollo 1 astronauts on the ground in a capsule fire. They had 100% oxygen in the, in the capsule and that was a huge setback, um, but uh, pretty, pretty amazing. India's 2013 mission, first one is still operational. So the ones that are in blue are in orbit right now. Uh, we have the MAVEN orbiter that we sent in 2013 that is still, uh, still um, in orbit. Uh, China right now has their Tianwen-1, um, and then we have our Mars 2020 mission. So Perseverance is the name of the rover, and Ingenuity is the name of the robotic helicopter, the UAV, that is going to be um, orbiting, or that is going to be hopefully flying over. Um, this is the SpaceX to Mars website. If you haven't seen this, you know, I've, I, Elon Musk is an interesting guy, and um, he also is the richest person in the world. He surpassed Jeff Bezos in the last month, I think, because of, you know, SpaceX and Tesla's success, uh, multiple things. Uh, but the subtitle there, the road to making humanity multiplanetary is one of the big motivators here to say we've had five extinction events in the history of our planet, the 4.5 billion year history of Earth, and the probability that we will have some other kind of extinction event, you know, it's out there. That's called an existential threat. And so this is, I took that little picture, the screenshot, that's a visualization of the starship. If you, if you haven't seen Matt Damon's movie, or he's, you know, the, the, the hero of it, uh, The Martian, that is really a, an excellent movie and showing a lot of technology and also a lot of engineering. I think they say something about he scienced his way out of that or something. He really engineered his way, you know, because in that, in that story, um, he was on a mission, a big dust storm came up, and he couldn't get back to the ship, and they blasted off without him, and so he had to survive on Mars alone, uh, until they could you know, send the mission to come back. Significantly, this mission that lands hopefully this week on February 18th, uh, that will be the first time we are going to try and return Martian soil to the United States, to, to Earth. 
So we are landing on the surface, the rover is gonna go and it's gonna drill in this delta to try to find you know, uh, what it can find. Hopefully we'll find fossils. We're looking for evidence of, of uh, biological life. We're not expecting to find any little green men, but we're, we're thinking that because we now believe water was on the surface of Mars in liquid form historically and water continues to be there, that's a key requirement for life. Um, we're going to be digging up the soil and not not anything that big, but we're going to be sending a rocket back to um, back to Earth. And I think, oh, maybe I don't have that page on here. So if you just Google the NASA Perseverance, um, this I'll I'll put this link in there too. This is the main NASA page for the Perseverance rover. And so that trailer, I think, so we're, we're four days, four hours, two minutes and 46 seconds away. Um, and then it talks about the different elements of the mission who have led it, um, the scientists, the descent. This is a depiction of the way it's going to drill into the surface. Uh, in one of the videos I watched, they just talked about the weight of the rover, like the weight of that part that's at the end of the arm is I think like 70 or 80 pounds, which is six times heavier than I think the first Pathfinder that we sent. So the complexity and capability of, of these, um, of these uh, devices that we're sending is just pretty astounding. Okay, so uh, we've already watched that. That was the landing animation of, of, the, uh, of the vehicle. Um, I don't think, I think I'm actually gonna have to just stop and not show any more videos. But if you wanna take a look at these, I'll, at some point I may show part of this. This is that 30 minute documentary that NASA premiered in January. It's called Down to Earth, The Astronaut's Perspective. Unbelievable, you know, there's a lot of work that the astronauts do, but floating, especially on a spacewalk, when you don't have glass, you, you have a, you have a, um, a helmet, visor but it's so big like no pictures no photography can adequately capture what our eyes can see and so to hear these astronauts talk about you know the impact of what's sometimes called the orbital perspective is is phenomenal so i'm not going to play that but that's that is fantastic check that out and then um this was a video i found too it's about six and a half minutes long but it's kind of rovers past and present talking about that a little bit so if you want to, you can take a look at those. Um, so what I want to do now is I'm going to actually uh, stop sharing my screen and stop our recording. Um, and then we'll just stay together for this part and do this table talk. And so my, the big question, what new insights do you have about our universe today as an adult that you did not have as a child? So let's say 